So I'm Ricardo Zanussi, chief architect in WeFox. WeFox, I don't know if you know, is an insult tech. It's a good term, good word, but let's see a little bit what the meaning. Following Investopedia, InsulTech is based on the belief that insurance, industry, rifle, innovation, disruption, and so digital innovation means that we are an insurance company, but we are not an insurance company that have 100 years of history, a big insurance company. We are an insurance company, we are seven years of history, and uh, we, have, we want to revolutionize the insurance, not only by making things different, but also on the organization of IT. We are fast growing. We want to arrive to 100% of growing every year. We are agile by default. Well, the other insurance company want to be agile and they are not. And we have a strategy based platform that the other company is struggling to do that because anytime we make something new, we have to build it from scratch and for the product. We have a 100% agile structure. It means that uh, we have domain, and after we explain what is the meaning, what is division of domain inside our company, and we have uh, different uh, uh, flavor, different uh, topics through the domain. On the architect, we have something that is above the domain called architectural governance boards. After all, we see exactly what the meaning. What we explain to you is because we want to make a real case in a real company that is trying to combine a platform with the growing at the same time. So we arrived to what we explain you after seven years of tried, seven years to look in what's happened, seven years of finding the best way to make a revolutionary, but also making the things right. In, this, in our company, we divide in another domain, not to look to anyone. If you see the, the light part, the digital customer part, our front-end domain, and the back-end part are divided like everyone can know, the part of the insurance, policy, customer, product, distribution, claims, and finance, and so on. So this is a typical division. And for the last one, we have a platform of strategy. That this is really what we, we want to innovate the market. So parallel of our insurance, our normal job, normal job of selling product and earning money for the insurance, we are building a platform that can manage all the product for the insurance, not just for us, but also for other company, and selling this product through different channels. This is completely flexible, completely product driven, and this is something that we think that the market is going. And this is an example of our company. We are on a startup in some way, also from seven years. We are starting like a legacy company, and we're starting also to innovate the market with a new IT stack. So how we manage the architecture job here? It's a special thing and probably other company have the same topic, have the same problem. To manage an architecture and company can grow fast, want to deliver any time, want to deliver every week new functionality. Architecture is difficult, but on the other time also there is some kind of legacy system. So what is the role of the chief architect? I'm chief architect. And after in the middle of the presentation, I give my, the word to my colleague, Mark, that is part of architect of one domain. We follow a little bit of the, the things about Gregor Hope. I think that many of them, many of you, you know it. And basically say that the architect is not more the people that draw diagrams or making things on just uh, imposing things to the rest of the company. But it's something that has a different job in terms of the organization. Different job to inspire, different job to counseling, different job to keep people together without imposing things. And the role of enterprise architect in a leading enterprise, we think that if you follow Gregor, he say, I have to share a vision about what we are going to, building bridges between the different parts of the, of the company, find new opportunities to change, new opportunity to introduce new things in the company, and build a community of learning. We have to rise up everything. We have to understand everyone about what is the meaning. And also from McKinsey, that I know it's a big company, but sometimes they make something that could be useful, is how enterprise architects need to evolve to survive in a digital world. It means that the best skill that have to have an enterprise architect, not surprising, is interpersonal skill. You know, we have 
lot of team, lot of agile team. Agile means that every team is independent to make its own choices, making its own things. But at the end, we also we have a strategy. We are not a startup the starting from scratch. And just we have a direction, we are going some place. So we have combined these two things, the independency, agile of the team, with the strategy of the company that also uh, targets for the chief architect to drive the full development in the same strategy. So the first thing that we have to have, like chief architect, is interpersonal skills. Architects, as I like the sentence, enterprise architects have been famous for being a wall of no. You cannot do that. You cannot use this database. You cannot use the things. You cannot make it this way. Because if doing this way is again the policy of the company, again the standard. I worked for some years in the biggest insurance company in the world, enterprise architect just making exactly this. No, 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 and no. You have to do it this way. We don't want to make it this way. We want to combine strategy, insurance company, but also agile, be free to do things. Okay, so we have to develop in all the team, the customer oriented, we have to develop the knowledge of the strategy, what means the strategy for all the team, and for that we need interpersonal skill. Of course we need professional competence, we need to know business topics and sol problem solving. But strange, the last two things, the enterprise architect in a lean company are technical software school and managerial skill. So that in this case, what we learn, because I don't tell you that the things we arrive to is happening one night. We have seven years in history, and this organization happened with stride, with error, with mistake, with understanding what's happening, and so on and so on. We arrive to this kind of organization. We have, I am the chief architect, I'm not belonging to any domain, and for every domain that we call it the division, we have what we call it architect or principal engineer. Just to making these things. This is translation between an architect but also have the technical skill to understand what the developer is doing, what many presentations are thinking about, uh, splitting microservices, on, and so on. But also, the contact with me, like chief architect, is mean that strategy of the company is never forgot. Because this is our driving. This is what we want to do. So we have to manage, we are the point of connection between these two things. Just to understand about the roles, what we have it. I'm the chief architect, I'm the chapter lead. I have the uh, architectural board lead with some veto powers. I, sometimes I say some no, not everyone, not every time. And, and I drive the medium and long term strategy. Of course, we have a plan, like strategy, that arrive until 2030. It's not a technological plan. Nobody knows what's happened in 2030. If I see we are in 2022 now. If you see seven years ago, what are the services that they are in Amazon, AWS, probably 70% of the services we use now are not there. So we cannot see we have a tech strategy completely defined for the 2030. But we have some idea about the general strategy where we have to go. That sometimes have some kind of influence on what we are doing now. The domain architect are for the domain architecture, internal microservices, code review, internal domain architecture, and most, many things that we see, that you see during these two days of presentation. And interaction between us is we have, and we see exactly the, this interaction, exactly what we are measuring and are measuring about, are uh, end to end technical architecture for specific business processes mean that the business processes, we have it like insurance, but also in another company, are through domains. It's not just one domain that decides what to do when a claim is arrive. When a claim is arrive, arrive a claim, have to check with policy, and to make it in payment, and to check with finance, to check with the customer. So the full flow of the new claim is through domains. And this is, is not reachable without drawing without the feeding together process that can embrace all the domain together and after decide what is the part that every domain can do and put in together. And this is the interaction between domain architecture that 
give the expertise for that, and chief architect that give the expertise about the full strategy and the full processes. And the second place, of course, meaning that we have an architecture and uh, we are a platform and we have some standard of technical, but we do it in the more open way. We make LFC and any developer, not only architect, can propose an LFC and be approved. And this LFC is becoming the standard of the company. But it's not the only architect that provides LSC. This is a full democratic process. So everybody can propose an LSC, everybody can look at C, everybody can go in on, everybody can go to the board and be approved. So don't, we don't enter in this diagram, but there are some points that I want put in this diagram. This is, for example, policy accounting. I don't explain you for the insurance time exactly what it is. But it's a simple diagram and is not voluntarily a diagram with a standard. Because this diagram has to be understood by the CTO, that is my boss, plus all the architect, all the developer, and also the product owner. So it's a mix between processes and the mix between sometimes technical things. That is Kafka, the, the middle, just to understand. This is synonym for us of messaging and queuing. So this is the type of diagram that we want to implement like end-to-end -end processes. And it covers more domain. And all the architects of this domain, not all the architects of the interested domain, participated to this diagram. And we implement this. So a business process spans multiple domains. The interested domain have to be agreed. Way to exchange information, data schema, security, GDPR, other compliance. We are the insurance company. We are heavily regulated in any country. And the problem that is that any can, regulation can be different in any country, also in Europe. And our ambition is to go on the world. So we have to be careful about what we are doing. And the data ownership. So as I tell, there is no standard for DIGA. We, are no, I, we try to follow a standard, but we have a lot of people coming from us, a lot of new developers. If for any one of that, we have to instruct to use some heavy standard. When I was in, in another insurance company, the biggest in the world, they make courses the last one week just to draw in diagrams. We don't have time to do, to do this. We want to make things fast, simply avail avail available. We have a note adding to the grammar, of course. It's not just a diagram. Architecture is not boxes and arrows. Everybody knows it. There is something more. And this is not the last step of developing. This is not given directly to developers. And we say before, this diagram is divided in domain. When all the domain involved are agree in this picture, in the big picture of the business process, this is going deep in this domain. And every domain is adding this part. It's adding this part of, the, of, uh, of uh, developing this part. So, this is, not this is not given directly to the program. Every domain take a care of this part, and going specific in this part, respecting every domain is doing. This is the first big process we have it. And the second big process is process LFC. The process of LFC in the, the diagram between the proposal and so on. Just making an example what would be an LFC is uh, the OAuth 2 we for concept the definition of example. We started with all two, we adding some specific things for us. We adding, we publish, and all the domain are working with that. This is why. Because at the end, we want to be an open platform, have an API. And it's not possible that every domain make its own standard for security. The face we have to keep speaking outside, there was people speaking with us, have to be the same for all the platforms. So this, we need an LSC. We do it, and we respect it. Parameter secret management, you know, the things is everybody can do whatever you want. No, we try to make it. We are an insurance company. We have really privacy data. We need to keep the data private. We need to keep the data safe. And we are with really personal data like health data. So we have to really understand everything that has to be secret. And for example, Kafka for an internal format, we have to, uh, it's an interface between domain. We are even driving between the platform with some 
uh, some concession, but basically we haven't run it. And the format of this change of data internal of Kafka have to be established. And this is a process for the things. We have a proposal, we requeue it, we have a draft, we have, some, we have a group, uh, I'm a chief architect, we have around 10 architects, one for every domain, more or less, and so we have needed until three architects to sponsor this proposal, and therefore we'll take it to the AGB. In the AGB, there is the, uh, as you see in the middle, there is the CTO, the chief of architect told me, the, the vice president of the platform development and vice president of client development. These four persons decide if the LDG is okay. Maybe sometimes we have new requests for new uh, uh, deepness of the LDG because it's too light or something can be changed. And when we arrive, we say it's approved and it's official published. The thing that VP of the platform development, VP of client development are participating in this decision means that the implementation of this standard is their task. But they cannot say that it's not involved in decision because they're part of the committee. So after this is decided, they are the people that implement this decision. And they tell you everything is open. The developer that entered last week can propose an LSE and this good is taken from the company. Of course, we cannot see that everybody can see immediately it's okay. We have a process, but they tell you, the AGB is meeting every week. Okay, so this is a way you start to, we uh, organize the architects. We organize internally. I know, as I tell you, I work for the big, the big insurance company in the world, and we have a lot of business architect, enterprise architect, solution architect, please, uh, system architect, application architect. We have just two parts because the other things is too complex. But we have it. We have a structure. We have something that drives the architecture of our platform, that drive the thing that developing our next future, our vision is on the track and is following our strategy. Because everything we do, we have a strategy that lasts years, but we have to follow that. So this is our, our environment we are doing. How we measure? Every end-to-end -end process lasts uh, more or less one month. But between three and six meetings of one hour, and the last time was two hours, or until we arrive to the final agreement. Elapsed time around one month. How we measure? Quantity, we have to have one business process every month. It's empiric, but we see that we keep, keep at the pace. More often was not good. And quality, how long it takes to implement, and how many modifications are required. And for LSC, we can have at least one or two LSC for every weekly board. One better two, because means that we, from us, we implement new LSC. And the quality between number of comments that understand how many people are interested, time on implementation, if we have absolute value, or how many tries is this LFC is going in the board. So this is how we measure the effective or the collaboration between chief architect and architects, and while we proceed to drive the company in the right way on the architectural tech of the company. Now, thank you. My colleague, Mal de Paul, that is principal engineer architect in the policy domain, that is the main domain we have, it because you know, we have insurance, so what is the best for insurance, the policy, what is the main, is playing the work of the principal engineer and the architect in the domain. So, uh, hello all, I'm Mark, and uh, I'm going to explain you, uh, yes, exactly what uh, Ricardo said about what's the, role, uh, what's the role of a principal engineer, of an architect in a domain, how we do it, and probably the most important part, and why we are all here, how we try to measure the impact that we have in the, in the domain, and of course, in the, in the whole company, right? So... Um, this, this, um, I think this, this is an interesting, uh, the interesting part here is that um, w when the company, the company with Fox some years ago was not structured in domains, so after uh, you know, learning from experiences, we saw that uh, we, had to, we had to change to this new organization. 
So um, we decided that we would embed an architect in every domain, right? So we had lots of philosophical conversations about what's the role, what should we do, should we code, shouldn't we code, uh, things like that, right? So at the end uh, of the discussion, we, we kind of um, agreed that uh, the, the architect uh, would be embedded in the team, right? So uh, you have probably seen this diagram. It's about uh, you know, the four different ways to embed architect, to do architecture in a company. Uh, benevolent dictator, primus inter pares. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting into details. You probably know this already. So, so uh, we decided that uh, yes, we would embed an architect in every team, right? So why that? Because we think that uh, this allows us to empower the team. It allows us to, it allows the team to focus on what really matters, and also. Uh, the architect can kind of, you know, uh, cover the team from, from noise. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we did. The, um, we, another interesting point is that we recently changed the name. Uh, it's not architect anymore, but principal engineer, right? This, uh, this might seem a little bit weird, but um, it was not just a naming change, it was also a little bit role change. It, it, it was not exactly a role change, but uh, we decided that there were kind of four pillars that we need to empower. So the, the architects, we kind of reviewed our uh, role and we said, okay, these four need, need to be, in, we need to put more effort on this, right? So first thing, it's uh, democratizing architecture and security among the team, which is, I mean, if, You've heard other speakers, and this is the trend right now. So we are very happy that we are following the trend, kind of without knowing it. But it's not a matter of having architects in, in towers deciding what to do. This, it was called architecture as a service. This is not happening anymore. So uh, we need to ma make sure that all the members of the team have uh, power, have, uh, you know, it's basically a learning experience. So um, the architects participate in, the architects do the, the main work basically, but then we need to allow all the developers to challenge those decisions, participate in those decisions, uh, create you know, a, what's called a positive feedback loop. So basically everybody learns from everybody. So uh, you are a principal engineer, you propose, something, this is challenged by a developer, and it's, yeah, all, everybody's happy. Um, this works the other way around as well. The, also we can all agree probably, and hopefully, that architects code, right? So we are software developers who, for some reason, we became principal engineers. So we still code, we still want to code. So. Participating in the coding and the code reviews, it's, it's a way to you know, tighten the, keep, the, the team, uh, build trust, you know, participating in pull requests. And uh, for me, in fact, uh, when, when I present, uh, when I propose an architecture to the team, and when they give me feedback about that, and when they see that uh, sometimes I, I hadn't taken something into account, something like that, for, for me, that's exactly a pull request to architecture, that's a code review to architecture. So I think that's, that's a very valid feedback. In fact, um, recently I've been involved in, in the policy domain, and uh, which is uh, a team that, uh, for historical reasons, is using TypeScript. I've been using JVM languages all my life, and right now I'm learning TypeScript. And you know, for the sake of having a peaceful event, I'm not going to comment on this anymore. But, uh, you know, it's everybody learns, and that's great. Then, uh, of course, if the team participates in, in the architecture, you are improving the ownership of the architecture, which is great. I mean, there's, there's not much to comment on that. And then um, the AGB decisions. As uh, Ricardo explained, we, has the, we have this RFC process, which is, I insist, and I will insist again, 
it's a very open process. You saw the diagram, it might seem a little bit complex, but it's not. Anybody can uh, propose an RFC, anybody can uh, comment on an RFC, so it's a very, very open process, right? So at the end, this process uh, finalizes, and uh, there's the AGB that says, okay, fine, approved. So that becomes uh, law. So that needs to be implemented. Um, sometimes uh, nobody from the domain participated in that RFC, so, but the thing is that all the domains need to implement that. So it's the, the role of the principal uh, engineer to go to the tech lead, product manager, and all the developers in the team and say, look, this has been decided. Um, it's a positive change, or it, it's something that we need to do. The, the, the problem is, of course, that, that that's work to do, right? But the, the role of the principal engineer is to communicate that in, in a positive way, right? So uh, how we do things, what, what we spend our time on, basically, in, in, as principal engineer of a domain. I would say that 80% of our work is inside the domain, 40%, which is 20% of the rest of the time, and 20% of the time that does not exist already. It's interaction between domains, and then you have more stuff to do, like transversal issues, right? It's, of course, it's more than 100%, but you all know what caffeine can do. So inside our domain, uh, we do basically three things. We do the uh, architecture proposals, let's, let's call it that way, which means that we do, of course, democratizing architecture does not mean that we don't do anything and we just let the developers uh, do the work and just say yes, no, no, that's not how it works. We, we do the heavy lifting, basically. We start thinking about what's the architecture, what's the vision, what, what do we want to do, how we want to do it, and then we have we have these uh, diagrams, uh, sequence diagrams, flow diagrams, whatever. It, we are kind of free to, do, uh, to use the tools that uh, we think uh, they are necessary. And then after that, we present it to the team, and that's when you have this you know, feedback loop um, of comments and, and things like that. So uh, basically, this is uh, to empower the team, and very important, to make sure that the conversations happen. We don't want to impose anything. Uh, it's not the architecture as a service. It's, look, this, is, this seems a good idea, let's, let's talk about that, and if we all agree, of course, uh, let's do it. The uh, thing is that here, um, you need to be aware that you are not falling into um, paralysis by analysis or something like that, because you know, architecture discussions tend to be lengthy. Some people, sometimes people just say, yeah, whatever, and some, sometimes people just keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. So you need to know, so just stop it here until here, but uh, yeah, you know, um, skills. Then uh, another part, uh, the interaction between domains. Of course, every domain needs to talk to other domains. Uh, that makes lots of sense. So uh, we are continuously trying to, to see how, how we do that, uh, find patterns, because really what we don't want to be, it to be is a big uh, distributed, big, bad, big uh, you know, mud ball, or yeah, I don't know the naming, but you get the idea. So we, we always constantly seeing how the interaction works and uh, what to do to improve it. And then we have transversal topics that we need to you know, think about uh, before that even can become an RFC or whatever. You know, GDPR, anyone? Probably you all know what it's about, you know, adopting new technologies, things like that. So that's, those are the transversal topics. For the interaction between domains and the transversal topics, we use the, um, yeah, the architecture chapter. Uh, it's basically a meeting, it's a forum where all the principal engineers and whoever needs to be in there just uh, talk about that. So that's, that's a really valid tool to you know, explain how things are doing. So when the AGB has decided something, yeah, that needs to be implemented. And so basically the technological vision is clear, right? So we need to do this. But of course, yeah, there are like, I don't know, eight domains and uh, each domain has its own circumstances. Like uh, every domain has different priorities, different stakeholders. It's very different if your domain has two stakeholders and they are mostly happy or if you have 15 hyperventilated guys who are constantly asking for a, Where's my stuff? 
So that, that basically means that uh, different domains will do things in a different speed, but that's good. That's, that's not a problem. We know that, we accept that, and uh, that's the way it works. The, and of course, the, the teams. The teams are different. Uh, you might have very good uh, developers, or uh, another team might be a little bit more conservative, so we need to all take uh, into account that speeds are going to be different. But at the end, everybody will need to implement what has been decided in the IGP, okay? So that's part of the solution. So we can never block for something. It's an insurance company. It's not something like we can say, hey, we will just stop everything for one week until we do this, this, and that in the background and then come back to you. No, this cannot happen. And um, we had a very big problem in the beginning, which is that uh, the, the decisions were made, were accepted by the CTO and the Pope and whoever had to accept them. And, uh, but the problem is that sometimes uh, the actions were back. So nobody knew exactly what to do. So if it's something that needs to be done, but you don't know exactly what to do, and there's nobody kind of chasing you about that, you know, things tend to go down in the backlog, and that's very, very bad. So one of the things we did was uh, when we realized that, we basically went into the RFC process and we introduced uh, two things. Basically, a definition of done, right? So uh, probably everybody understands what's that, okay. And then the fitness functions or the metric that had to be implemented in order to say, yes, this domain has done this, and this is the fitness function. That, uh, the fitness function allows us to see that, yes, definitely that has been done. And most importantly, that that decision has a positive impact, right? So this is it. This, is, has, this has been by far the most important challenging part of, of our journey from to, to get into the domains and to, to become uh, principal engineers of, of the domains. So. Yeah, what I just told the RFC process, it's, it's that diagram. That diagram, it's not, uh, we, we didn't create it in one day. We created one, it, got, it evolved. It's continuously evolving, it's right now it's evolving. We just introduced this concept of uh, the, every RFC process needs to introduce the metrics that will show the impact, right? Um, so also something that we really under, uh, we saw that you need to be able to communicate these kind of decisions in a very positive way. It's not like, hey, we need the AGB decided that we need to do things this way. No, why? Because we, we need to explain how things go. We need to explain that this change is positive. It might not be positive now, but in the future, we will need it, right? Very, very important point, the architectural fitness functions. We've been talking about them since uh, forever, metrics. This is why we are here, right? So how to know if something is good or is bad, right? And uh, basically all of this combined, the, these fitness functions and the metrics allow us to see this, uh, to have this transparency and visibility about which domains have been doing uh, the work that needs to be done and also to see that uh, what was decided in the AGB is, uh, is impacting in a, in a positive way. Uh, problems, of course, fitness functions. Uh, in fact, in the, the, we had some questions about them. They are hard. Um, they're hard to measure. Like usability, how, how do you measure usability, right? So you need to, it's not straightforward. Every, everybody might have different ideas Everybody might have um, different opinions. So that, that's what we think that it's really, really important to have them defined in, in, in the proposal. Because otherwise, what happens? That people, uh, just a team, they get an HB decision, they implement it, but uh, the change is no, I mean, the, what's the impact of the change? It's nowhere to be found, right? Or what's worse, that it was also a topic of another talk, uh, they put wrong metrics because those metrics were, you know, those Grafana dashboards were easy to do. They put them there, but those metrics have nothing to do, are not exactly related to uh, what the change uh, was meant. 
This is a shamefully easy example of our perfect uh, metric uh, or uh, yes, monitoring, right? So we had an RFC that um, we are using Kafka. And you know, Kafka has topics. And I don't know if you have experience with that, but if you don't, if you don't have a naming convention, when you list the topics in Kafka, that's a nightmare. Uh, nobody knows who which topic belongs to who, you don't know what's in there, you don't know if that's obsolete or deprecated, whatever. So one of the first things we did after setting up Kafka was, okay, this is the naming convention. If you want to create a topic, perfect, do it, do whatever you need, but please follow this naming convention. That's trivial to write the fitness function, right? So you basically need a Python script that lists the topics, checks the names, and if there's something wrong, just increment the metric, that's it. Right? So um, the other day, I got an alert. Somebody had created uh, you know, topics, wrong topics in staging. So you get the alert, you go, to the, you go to the dashboard, you see what happened, and then you just you know, go to chase the erratic that you know, did this. But I mean, that's just a very easy example of something that's extremely easy to do. Unfortunately, it's not always like that. And um, it, it's not only that, so we have fitness functions that kind of, uh, and metrics that try to, you know, uh, yeah, m measure impact, but uh, with all th other things as well. And I think that's, that's kind of important. Those, that might be not very scientific, they, done, they might not translate into metrics, but uh, that's, that's the, another way that we measure our success. Uh, having real standards. We understand standards as something very positive. Uh, what we need to do is, for some parts of the coding, uh, some parts needs to be boring, like authorization. If you need authorization into, into your service, don't reinvent the wheel. Go there, get that, use that. It doesn't, it's a thin red line between architecture and, uh, you know, um, engineer productivity, but th that's something that we 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 uh, take very ser seriously. Some parts need to be just boring. Okay, the last the last point of here of those examples is documentation. Uh, we focus it growing a lot in terms of business, but also in terms of new new joiners. So uh, documentation it's key, it's key because I mean you, wh what you cannot do is every month explain the architecture to everybody. So um, what, we are, what we are doing is uh, we're having uh, documentation as a first class citizen. Architecture diagrams are usually done uh, with uh, coding tools. So it's uh, Mermaid and, and things like that where you basically, it's a text file which gets rendered into the diagram. You can put that into your Git. So uh, we are using that a lot. So up-to-date documentation, that's very important. Also roadmap. Uh, everybody, we understand that everybody in the team, every developer, should have a clear vision of where we are going, right? So that's what also one of the roles of the principal engineer, just make sure that everybody understands at least a little bit where we are going. That's important. And then uh, this is basically a very unscientific thing that uh, at least I, I try to, to do. And uh, it's, it's something similar to the what the facts per minute when you are reviewing code. but in architecture. So when in a meeting or in a discussion somebody says, okay, well, whatever, you are the architect, it means that uh, wrong, there's something wrong here. It means that uh, we haven't convinced that person, uh, we, the, the, the conversation didn't go well, so basically says, okay, you have more authority than me, it's, it's your problem. This is, uh, of course, it's yeah, very unscientific, but it's a way to know if uh, things are going well or not. Then uh, another common is we used to hear that a lot before RF RFCs are useless because nobody implemented them, but that, that also changed. We, we hear that uh, less and less. And, um, and that's it. That's basically how, how we track things in, in WeFox. And uh, that's it. Thanks, and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, hello. Actually, uh, we have a lot of a lot of uh, interesting questions. Um, 
So what is the ratio architect um, slash engineers per domain? That's a good question, and uh, because the the domains uh, that depends on the domain. Uh, for example, the domain I'm in, it's uh, 13. We are 13, so it's 10 engineers plus one architect. There are some domains which are slower because it's not because they have different needs, but they haven't grown yet. I mean, we are hiring, so um, there are less engineers. But usually, it's uh, around 10 people should be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, do you have metrics on the RFC process? How many people collaborate, uh, rejection rate, etc.? Yes, we have it. Because basically the analysis is published on Confluence. So we see immediately by really empirically the name of the comment, meaning that the people are interested, or people want to change, and so on and so on. We don't, we don't check the tone. Everybody can see everything. and. Uh, the, we are a company that is developer from many places, so everyone can have a different opinions. So, but you see something interesting, or something maybe can hurt a little bit, because it's, oi, I'm doing something like now that something is not going well, so I have to change it. But the number of comments is a really thing that been interesting. I don't say that an LSC that is no comment is not done because nobody cares. But the see of the comment usually is a big impression about uh, if the LSC is, is going, is really impacting the company. Mm -hmm. uh, the veto of the chief architect was mentioned twice, but why do you need that, um, in my opinion? I don't know uh, whose opinion is that. Uh, the, the, the discussion could be based on content, uh, on contents and disagree. Okay, sorry, I can't read it, expand it. Um, just a second. Okay, uh, could be based on contents and disagree and uh, commit is also always an option. You want me to repeat? The vet of the uh, chief architect was mentioned twice, but why do you need that? In my opinion, the, dis uh, the discussion could be based on contents and disagree and commit is also always an option. The rate of the chief, rate of the chief architect, I see. The method. Ah, the veto, yes, the because veto. Hmm. the veto, yes, I understand. I never use the veto, I have to say. But if uh, sometimes there is some kind of fashion or some kind of not understanding that the, all the consequences of some decision. I have one times that I always, almost use the veto when he's speaking about, and I don't want to open another discussion, as you say, it could be dangerous for the peaceful of the conference about uh, polling and uh, callback on the API. So there is a big discussion. I have my opinion. I think that the one, I don't say what are the parts because <laughs> we can discuss it after if you want. And uh, there is a big discussion because for me, the, 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 the thing that I don't want it could be really dangerous. And the other three parts are the grief for the other part. So I was tempted to do it. But at the end, as the, the guy make the question suggest, we finish discussing and making a, little, little version of the or choice that was chosen, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I try always to make it, but in the stream case, because I'm chief architect, at the end we are architectural things, I have the final authority to say no. I don't have the authority to say yes. This is a majority. But I have authority to say no because I know that what's happened in other company, in other contests, that this is, could be really a worse decision. Um, thank you. How do you tackle dependencies between domains? You want it. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, it's easy because <laughs> I, I, I arrived to the point to make the process. End to end process, as you say before, is really a big diagram. There is something happening here, this communicating here, this is doing something, and after communicating with him, with him. But when I write to the point to decide more detailed things, I pay the things to domain. I think that they are enough grown up to decide by yourself and, and find the point of contact and decide things because I don't want to go too deeper. Not, not because I can't, but because they have the responsibility to do it. So, But um, in fact, the dependencies, uh, they are always there, but uh, we never found uh, a big issue, let's say. I mean. 
the dependencies are pretty clear, and when there is something that it's entangling too much, we just sit down peacefully and decide, okay, well, let, let's try to find a, a better way to communication. That, that's it. We, we, uh, we never had this big issue of uh, this is too entangled, we don't know how to do, how to do it. We, we never faced that. Thank you. And uh, could you expand on why the responsibility sums up more than 100% of time? Uh, no, it's not, it was not responsibility, it was the amount of time dedicated to, to staff. It was just a back joke, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so let's see if we have more questions. Uh, responsibilities and focus, 160%. Would you tend to compromise the most? Um, or how much time you work overtime? Right, no. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm not going to do that joke again. The, what's, uh, the focus, it's, it's very clear uh, for, uh, for uh, our position, the principal engineers in the domain. So uh, our focus, it's, it's the domain itself. Definitely. Um, the overtime, nope. <laughs> we, we tried not to do overtime. Uh, you know, there are always projects that uh, require it, but that's definitely uh, not the way it is usually. But uh, I would insist, uh, we, our responsibility is the domain and we focus on the domain. Of course, there are lots of things to do as well, but uh, that's, that's no, uh, there's no discussion on that. It's company, we don't push over time, so it's, we are the T. Sometimes happen, you know, sometimes happen always, but we don't push over time. We have to work the way you have to work. And for the, con for the responsibility between the domain there, of course, they are the principal engineer of the domain. I take their time sometimes when we need it. Sometimes I say, now we speak two hours about the things because it's becoming a problem. These, the things become, because we have to define the full process. Without that, we cannot go on anyway. So I take their time and they happily or not happily adapted to my request. But uh, this is the way we are doing. They are responsible in the domain, but domain means also the interaction. Also, a business process that includes their domain is their domain that are in this business process. So they have to take care and take ownership of their part and understand and accept what are their part. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, how would you approach scaling when a domain would be owned by more than one team? There is more than one team in one domain. Owned by more than one team? No, there is no one team that owns one domain. It could be one domain that have more than one team in their domain, but there is no one team that own more than one domain. Mm -hmm. They are really struggle. At the beginning, was made a, a heaven storming, understanding about the size of what are the domain. And basically, we are reflecting the structure until now. Maybe we add one domain or something like that, but the structure basically is stable. Because mm -hmm. in this way, it's enough easy. Insurance business is something old, so we, we don't tend to invent the wheel again. The, the domains more or less are these ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many time per week is spending the chief architect on one-to-one -one meetings with the principal engineers? I spend... I try to make a cycle that I, in this time there, there is more, more or less 10 engineers, and then to make in, in two or three weeks, making a full cycle one-to-one -one and start it again. Of course, there are some special events like performance review and these institutional things, but I try not to stop never to make in one-to-one. -one. Usually a cycle one-to-one -one with, with everyone for have his own hours busy and so on, and it's uh, just not to make it too fast, it's between two and three weeks. But when I finish, I start again. I never lost the touch with them. I don't say that I enter in the micromanage, absolutely not, but I want to know if they have a problem. They know that anytime, anyway, they can call me and say, Ricardo, I need one hour with you because there is a special, I, I have 15 years experience in insurance, so I have need to understand exactly what the problem is and I understand another thing, so they are completely free anytime to fix me one hour and they speak about things, but anyway, we have one-to-one -one in continuous cycling. 